Is it possible that despite Peter Dutton's plan to fast track nuclear energy in Australia, our electricity market is so dysfunctional that there are almost no good options available to us? That it's not a choice between disaster and blackouts under wind and solar unreliables versus abundant power and happiness through nuclear, but rather a choice between a total disaster and just a slightly less awful bad state of affairs. Electrical engineer and other side energy commentator Ben Beatty says the glimmer of sanity behind a state-owned nuclear power company is probably the best shot we've got at a low-cost secure energy future. It'd be cheapest, he argues, if we just had full-scale unapologetic return to coal. But that's not going to happen in the current political climate, with so much billionaire wealth being poured into unreliables like wind and solar. So Ben argues that an expensive taxpayer-funded joint jaunt down the yellow cake road makes a kind of sense. Ben Beatty joins me now from Brisbane. Ben, thanks a lot for your time again. Good to have you back. Good day, Damien. Mate, this is bad news for libertarians and free market-loving uh, classical liberals, but, but you don't think that the private sector can save the electricity system. Why not? No, you're, you're right, Damien. I, I don't think it can. I don't think the private sector ever had a chance. Uh, we've had renewable energy targets uh, since the early 2000s, and successive governments have ramped up the market distortions to the point where the only investment that makes sense to uh, to return a profit to shareholders is something that gets a seat at the table, that is qualifies for the subsidies. And I think I think we need to face the reality that a government uh, with what say low cost of capital, long investment horizons, and uh, I think more importantly, a mission to reset the electricity system to something that's dominated by baseload, which is predictable and reliable. I think that's the only logical path to low-cost retail electricity. There's no path to lower electricity bills through a system built on the back of small, dispersed, intermittent, weather-dependent generators. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. So, yeah, well, certainly not with, with the unreliables, but even with nuclear, you're saying, of course, that government will have lower cost of capital. It has those, as you said, long investment horizons, so it can invest for the long haul, uh, more than private businesses would probably. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got to have that sort of centralised management in short, to, to ensure that we have that reliable baseload uh, delivery of, of electricity, right? Yeah, 100%. And we've got the problem where you've got the state's uh, obviously, everyone knows they're all a Labor government, so they're going to oppose anything a federal LNP government decides to do. Uh, and you might get the same reaction if it was if the tables were turned, if all the states were Liberal and, and the federal government was Labor. But it it looks like we get we may have a possibility of a federal LNP going up against the states. Now, I think uh, as soon as, say, for example, Peter Dutton gets in, Ted O'Brien becomes the Energy Minister, and they start trying to do this stuff. Uh, re reset the system to baseload dominated, um, which I think is the only sensible option. The Labor states, the opposition states, will lethally chime in and call them climate deniers and you know market market wrecking, you know yeah. big government, all, all the rest of it. It'll all happen, and they will oppose it at every step. So I think um, yeah. there, there's going to be some intervention somewhere which resets it. Yeah, it's just a tragic. Uh, situation that we just can't get organised. But as you say, I mean, we can't take out coal, which provides the base load power that we need and that reliability, and replace that with the unreliable energy from wind and solar. And I call them unreliables instead of renewables, not because I'm trying to be smart or clever or, you know, be propagandist like the left are uh, in changing language, but because it's closer to the truth, right? I mean, it's just true. You know, these are not reliable power sources because they are dependent upon the weather conditions and uh, we just can't rely on them for, for baseload. And they're not really renewable either, right? Which is the other reason I don't like using the term renewables. Um, you wrote something pretty interesting in your Spectator article though, mate, about uh, rooftop solar that I didn't realise. It is actually the largest electricity source on the grid. So when they're on, yeah. they're basically all on. And there's no control of that of that output. You can't you can't turn it down. You can't turn it up. It just it just dumps its electricity into the grid a lot of the time with some uh, fat feed-in tariffs, of which 
<laughs> I'm actually a beneficiary, so I feel I feel um, comfortable saying that we should get rid of them because yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I have benefited from them. Not in your well, economic self-interest, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so mate, look, basically, that's the shocking thing. But your your issue, right, is sorry to interrupt you, but your issue, just just to get to the point, is that you think that that's market distorting, right? That the the fact that that is the main source of power, yet we have no control to turn it up or down, is actually affecting the business case or the the viability of businesses to provide other forms of energy into the grid. That's right. It's a it's a market share problem. So with this massive combined generator that has no control, it doesn't respond to market signals. It doesn't respond to anything except clouds and and nighttime, to be honest. <laughs> so that that causes periods of abundance in electricity where you see um, a lots of rooftop solar and and a, and a low demand day and lots of rooftop solar is forcing other generators to close and shut down completely during the day. Uh, and you have periods of scarcity where they just don't exist at all, which is at, at a funny coincidence when everyone's getting home from work and turning on their heaters at this time of year, turning on the TVs, their ovens and, and the hot water systems get a run too. So this is all this is all genuine technical problems with the solar and the market share is the is the economic problem for the baseload generators in general yeah so it's proving a, disin a disincentive for them so so enter uh you know elbows genius energy minister chris bowen and his capacity investment scheme guaranteeing as socialists love to do minimum revenue for all generators so you you know you guys will fix it We'll give you. We'll make sure that you have a buyer of last resort. That'll be the government, or really the taxpayers, right? So we are committed, and as you say in your article, that kind of mocks um, the market signals, the consumer bills. It's it's a bit of a, a laugh at the way the the market should operate. Um, and, and if they, these guys are getting overpaid by the state, uh, that's going to just send prices even higher, right? Well, what it'll there's an interesting conundrum here because what will happen is if you have too much supply forced into the system and it's got guaranteed revenue, so it's not necessarily responding to the market signal. So it'll it'll offer its product, its electricity, for as, as low as possible to the market because it doesn't care because it's getting propped up by the taxpayer. So it just wants to I don't know, make, make a few bucks on the side. Of, and that'll what what'll, that'll do is it'll drive the wholesale price very, very low. Now, some people look at that and go, oh, that's a good thing. But if you talk to anybody who knows, uh, has a few insights about how the market might work to fund a new generator, build a new generator, pay it off over time, very, very low wholesale prices are the opposite of what we want. We yeah. want something in the order of somewhere between 70 to $150 a megawatt hour um, in, in that range. But if the capacity investment scheme gets up and you get this um, massive influx of generators, which are paid um, paid to stay afloat, they're not really caring what the wholesale price is. The wholesale price will go very, very low, negative most of the time. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. that right. do for the rest of the market? <laughs> no incentives whatsoever for anybody to get into the market. It just distorts the whole dog thing and creates a complete mess, as government normally, normally interference normally does. So um, nuclear then uh, will not really be able to fix this, but you're saying that a, that a well-managed nuclear system w that is, yeah. does have to be sort of centralised, um, is that going to be cheaper than doing what we're doing now? And, and I think you've got some pretty amazing statistics, right, based on Chris Bowen's numbers. A renewables dominated system has a lot of stuff, a lot of distributed generators, batteries, synchronous condensers, wind and solar farms, um, electric vehicles, a lot of transmission lines. All that stuff needs to be working, talking together, uh, weather, weather allowing, plus all your backup systems as well, which is your gas and your pumped hydro. That's, that's a lot of physical stuff out there that consumers have to pay for. With a baseload dominated system, you've actually got less stuff. Yeah, because they want to put the nuclear stations where the existing coal stations are. So you don't have to build all that new infrastructure, or at least a lot less of it, is the point. That's Peter Dutton's plan. So the predictability of the baseload combined with less stuff to pay for means lower bills for consumers. Um, if the baseload is nuclear, it will be more expensive to build than coal. Uh, but if you're concerned about emissions, well, that's 
that's the cost you should be willing to bear, right? Yeah, we're not going um, back to coal. If you're not concerned like... about emissions, <laughs> I'll put myself yeah. firmly in that bucket. <laughs> um, You'd rather we stuck with coal, mate. <laughs> yeah. Coal is cheaper. Coal has a few issues depending on whether the fuel is linked to global prices. Okay, now look, we, we have to wrap up, but just very quickly, Chris Bowen put a figure of $122 billion on that total cost of his plan to get Australia to renewables at 82% level. Uh, so 82% renewables by 2030, which is only six years away. So 122 billion, he's saying. Um, AMO is saying it'll cost 373 billion. Why is there that difference between those two numbers? Well, Chris Bowen's picked out one of the headline figures from AMO's spreadsheet. It's not a real number. Uh, the capital that AMO expects to spend on generators alone uh, is in the order of ramping up to $15 billion per year, $15 billion per year up to 2040, and then about $20 billion per year after that. And that, that total comes to $373 billion. The figures to replace all of our coal units with nuclear only comes to $168 billion. So I'd invite someone like AMO to throw a bit of nuclear in their model and do something which makes a bit of sense for us. Uh, excuse me, Ben, did you just say that AMO hasn't done the modelling for nuclear? No, they haven't done the modelling for nuclear. Holy cow. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. So the number they've come... Oh, I wonder why, actually, why they haven't done it. Uh, $373 billion for, uh, for the plan with unreliables. But if you put nuclear, it goes down to 100 and, around $186 billion as a as a projection. Uh, or, yeah, it's less than half. Yeah, well, you know, these government spreadsheets, you can always double it and add a bit, right, uh, if you want the real cost. But in any case, we know that nuclear is less than half. Ben, we are out of time, but, mate, thanks very much for coming back on and explaining all of that to us as well as you always do. Uh, great to chat with you. Ben Beatty, our uh, energy expert and also host of the Baseload podcast, if you want to hear Ben talk about this stuff in a little bit more detail if you're technically minded. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that clip. The Other Side is your weekly analysis of the media's best news and commentary without the woke. And we need your support. Please make sure you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on X at The Other Side on X. It's all totally free to do that. But we could always do with your financial support too. So if you'd like to make a donation, click the super thanks button on YouTube with a little dollar sign and thanks on it right under the video frame below. Even a $2 donation will really help us. And if you're watching on YouTube, do check out the full episode that this clip came from right here.